I joined the Combined Cadet Force at school in the 50s. The alternative was to be lumped in with a disrespected group who were dragooned into manual labour such as snow clearing, leaf sweeping, monotonously manoeuvring a hefty roller along cricket pitches, or other general cleaning tasks. Certainly the choice would have been a no-brainer for me. While they scrubbed, scraped, swept and rolled, we dug trenches, learnt to read maps with oil-filled compasses, polished brasses, buffed boots, and learned to dismantle Sten guns and strip and clean 303 rifles. What was not to like? Naming of parts is the first and most frequently included in anthologies of six poems written by Henry Reed in 1942. It's a gentle, if somewhat condescending, parody on his wartime training as a soldier. It's requested by Mike Putnam. Mike explicitly did not want me to read the second poem, Judging Distances. As we'd been in the glorious Prince Albert pub for a while, I didn't explore why he didn't want me to read it, but decided that, in the sober light of the new day, he'd have forgotten. I think the two work well together. Since discovering them many years ago, I've read the remaining four poems in the series, and I think their quality tapers off. The poet is being instructed during a fine spring spell, and the view through the window distracts his attention. Daydreaming blighted my own education too, still does, but at least now no one expects me to be attentive, much less to stand to attention in the process. Lessons of the War Part 1 Naming of Parts Today we have naming of parts. Yesterday we had daily cleaning, and tomorrow morning we shall have what to do after firing. But today, today we have naming of parts. Japonica glistens like coral in all of the neighbouring gardens, and today we have naming of parts. This is the lower sling swivel, and this is the upper sling swivel, whose use you will see when you are given your slings. And this is the piling swivel, which in your case you have not got. The branches hold in the gardens their silent, eloquent gestures, which in our case we have not got. This is the safety catch, which is always released with an easy flick of the thumb. And please, do not let me see anyone using his finger. You can do it quite easy if you've any strength in your thumb. The blossoms are fragile and motionless, never letting anyone see any of them using their finger. And this, you can see, is the bomb. The purpose of this is to open the bridge, as you see. We can slide it rapidly backwards and forwards. We call this easing the spring. And rapidly, Backwards and forwards, the early bees are assaulting and fumbling the flowers. They call it easing the spring. They call it easing the spring. It's perfectly easy if you have any strength in your thumb, like the bolt and the breech and the cocking piece and the point of balance, which in our case we have not got and the almond blossom silent in all of the gardens, and the bees going backwards and forwards. For today, we have naming of parts. Lessons of the War, Part 2, Judging Distances Not only how far away, but the way that you say it is very important. Perhaps you may never get the knack of judging a distance. But at least you know how to report on a landscape, the central sector, the right of the arc and that, which we had last Tuesday. And at least you know that maps are of time, not place, so far as the army has to be concerned. The reason being is one which need not delay us. Again, you know there are three kinds of tree, three only. The fir and the poplar, and those which have bushy tops to. And lastly, that things only seem to be things. 
A barn is not called a barn, to put it more plainly. Or a field in the distance where sheep may be safely grazing. You must never be over sure. You must say when reporting at five o'clock in the central sector is a dozen of what appear to be animals. Whatever you do, don't call the bleeders sheep. I'm sure that's quite clear. And suppose, for the sake of example, the one at the end asleep endeavours to tell us what he sees over there to the west and how far away, after first having come to attention. There to the west, on the fields of summer, the sun and the shadows bestow vestments of purple and gold. The still white dwellings are like a mirage in the heat, and under the swaying elms a man and a woman lie gently together. Which is, perhaps, only to say that there is a row of houses to the left of the ark, that under some poplars a pair of what appear to be humans appear to be loving. Well, that, for an answer, is what we rightly call moderately satisfactory only. The reason being is that two things have been omitted, and those are very important. The human beings now, in what direction are they? And how far away would you say? And do not forget, there may be dead ground in between. There may be dead ground in between, and I may not have got the knack of judging a distance. I will only venture a guess that perhaps between me and the apparent lovers, who incidentally appear by now to have finished, at seven o'clock from the houses is roughly a distance of about one year and a half.